tried it all. Every self-help fad, every pleasurable pursuit, every achievement, every ego booster, every feel-good, do-good, be-good activity under the sun. But nothing worked. Nothing could satisfy him. Well, it may sound like I'm talking about a reality star or a Hollywood celebrity, but actually, it's a VIP of another era. King Solomon had everything money could buy, everything that power could provide, and every path that man could pursue— But in the end, nothing could fill that void in his heart. Of course, we know, and eventually he discovered, that emptiness is God drawing us to himself. And the same is true for us. God wants to be our satisfaction and our highest pursuit. When knowing and loving God becomes our goal, he fills that deep place in our hearts as only he can. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, will teach us more about this in our study in Ecclesiastes 7. This is why we come every day to the study of God's Word, not to simply become more knowledgeable about the Bible, but to grow in our knowledge and love for Jesus Christ. As Dr. McGee said, the Word of God points us to the Son of God, His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what a sister in Bulgaria wrote to tell us recently. She writes, I'm so thankful for Through the Bible. We have a lot of people in one house, and I'm not always able to read the Bible in peace and absorb it. You help me to feel close to God and encourage me as a mother and wife when I sometimes feel weak. I definitely feel God when I listen. For many years, my faith was weak. My husband was an alcoholic, and I felt as if my family was falling apart. Then a friend told me about your messages. I began listening and didn't stop. I asked Jesus to save me, and he hasn't let go. I have recently taken a job as a night worker, and your programs help me with whatever I experience and what hardships come my way. I become more compassionate to those around me as well. Please keep broadcasting. My husband has begun to listen as well. Well, it's wonderful testimonies like this that stir our hearts to pray for Through the Bible listeners around the world. And that's the heartbeat of our world prayer team that travels the world on our knees praying for people in different countries. Now, this week, we're praying for people like this listener in Central Europe. If you want to learn more about our world prayer team and to sign up today, visit ttb.org forward slash pray. Please join us for a great prayer adventure. And speaking of that, let's begin our time in God's word now with prayer. Thank you, Father, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, your word stirs our hearts and draws us to your Son. Please show us Jesus in your word and what our lives can be like in Him today. We pray this in His precious name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we come to the seventh chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, and this is the last experiment that Solomon made. As we said at the beginning, he made an experiment in life to try everything under the sun that's possible for a man to try to see if it would bring satisfaction and enjoyment to him. And he tried it all, and it didn't. He tried science, or the study of the natural laws of the universe. You'd think that that would make some contribution. It did, but did not satisfy. And then he went into the study of philosophy and psychology. It did not satisfy. Pleasure, he went the limit there, and materialism. And he tried fatalism, which is a popular philosophy today of living, and egoism or egotism, living for self, then religion, and religion will never satisfy, only Christ can, and wealth was something that they tried. This man Solomon tried it. He was the wealthiest man in the world, but he found out he couldn't eat gold. He found out that gold did not bring satisfaction in and of itself. Now, the last test is what we've labeled is morality. Actually, what we have here is the do-gooder before us. 
the man who becomes a do-gooder down here. And I would say that this is the place today where the majority of people in this country, and I think still a majority, are moving. They are moving as a do-gooder, and they're going down the middle road of life on the freeway of life. And you find in this group the Babbitts on Main Street in the big city. They're doing business under a neon sign. They live out in suburbia in a sedate, secluded, and exclusive neighborhood. And they're taking it easy. Their children go to the best schools, move with the best crowd, and they go to the best church, the richest church in the neighborhood the one with the tallest steeple, the loudest bell or chimes, that has a very educated preacher. He knows everything that man can possibly know except the Bible. doesn't seem to know it. But that would, of course, cause him to lose his job if he found out what the Bible was all about. And that's the man we're talking about now. And you'll notice how he begins this. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death and the day of one's birth. That's interesting. And it's true, by the way. There's nothing wrong with a statement. A good name is better than precious ointment. Nice to hear people say nice things about you. Oh, that Mr. Jones or that Mr. Smith or that Mr. Brown or Black or Blue, whoever he is. He's a wonderful neighbor. Never had an argument with him. He doesn't discuss religion or politics. He doesn't get involved in any bad situation. Really never has taken a stand, I guess, on anything. He just smiles and goes right down the middle of the road. <laughs> never veers from one side to the other. He doesn't seem to be too happy or too contented, but that's the way that he's living today. He's a very respectable man. We all think a great deal of him in the community. They recognize him in all of the different organizations of the town, and he does business with all kinds of people. Well, isn't that the thing? And he'll have a funeral someday, and the preacher's going to push him right into heaven. There'd be no question about that. And that is what life is all about, according to him. Solomon tried that, said it's not what life's all about at all. Notice now, a good reputation and a long eulogy at a funeral. That's the thing you ought to strive for down here. But that won't satisfy you. Now, notice verse 2. It's better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting, for that's the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Well, you see, he goes from the knife and fork club to the funeral service, and all of it's done in a very dignified manner. <laughs> Nothing really happens. The knife and fork club, some man comes in and talks to him on pollution, not that they're going to do anything about it, but they're going to talk about it. And then next week they have a man that's going to talk to them on some of the civic problems. They're going to listen to it. And again, nothing will be done. And then they will all go to the funeral when one of the brothers in the lodge dies. And they hear some nice things said about him. Nobody's particularly moved. Nobody's going to miss him too much. He's just life. That's the way we live it in our hometown. And very frankly, friends, I can't blame a lot of these young people from rebelling against that. To me, it's a lot of blah. I'm glad I never lived it like that. I don't live it like that today. To me, this is the worst situation of all. I'll be honest with you. This is not life. This is not living at all. Now, notice verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart's made better. Oh, may I say that they want to arrange it so you can laugh all the way to the cemetery. You see, if you cover up everything with flowers and you have a lot of soft music, 
And the preacher says a lot of easy things and nice things. Everybody's going to go home and say, well, my, we had a nice funeral. <laughs> Laughing all the way to the cemetery. My, that's life for a great many folk. Now, will you notice verse 4? The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. He doesn't get 50 yards away from the cemetery till somebody tells a joke, and they all have a good laugh. This is living in the presence of death. And doesn't it somehow occur to some folk today that as they see their friends slipping out of this life, that they're moving somewhere, they're going somewhere, and it might be well to check in and to see where they're going. Are they saved? Are they lost? Are they rightly related to God? Well, that's not important. Oh, Mr. So-and-so, he was a good fella. <laughs> he always gave to the community chest, and his wife was active in the Red Cross. And they were active citizens in the community, which means that they do practically nothing. That is, they really wouldn't take a stand on a vital issue. They wouldn't dare do a thing like that. And now from now on, verse 5, down through the remainder of this chapter, the whole point is this, and let me lift out. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. But why not try both of them? That's the way to do it. Some brother comes in and says, I think you are wrong about this. Agree with him. And then you go down and listen to that rock band, and you enjoy that too, you see. But the idea is one may be better than the other, but it's easier to go with both groups. That's the picture that we have here. Let's move on down in it. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This is emptiness. You can go with that crowd and have your cocktail hour, the happy hour. You can do that. and Then go to church on Sunday. It's all nice. That's the way we do it in our hometown. He goes on to say here, verse 9, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Don't get angry at anything. Be a nice fella. Don't fall out with anybody. It helps business, by the way, and it's an easier way to go. And all that you have through this section is this. Take it easy. Walk softly. Don't be an extremist. Don't go nuts on religion. Avoid the left and the right. Don't be a leftist. Don't be a rightist, either in religion or politics. Just take it easy. Go down the middle of the road. Compromise. Don't fight. Switch. If you're with this crowd, go with them. If you're with that crowd, go with them. Whoever you're with, go with them. You can look religious on Sunday. And, my friend, you can live like hell on Saturday night. And you can still pass the day as a Christian. A man said to me that had been drunk as a lord on Saturday night, said to me Sunday morning, he says, I want you to know I'm a Christian. What do you think I am, a pagan? And you know, that's what he was. That's the picture that's presented here. Now, there's several things in this chapter I'd like to call attention to. Verse 11, Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there's profit to them that see the sun. Now, wisdom, and we said at the beginning of the book of Proverbs that wisdom is another name for Christ. We're told today that he's been made unto us wisdom. And in the midst of this here, of where a man is trying to go with both groups and take the middle of the road, he says it's well for you to have wisdom, and it's well to have Christ today. Now, he says, verse 12, for wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. This man wants to have plenty of money, but he doesn't want to have Christ. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. And you can't buy life with money. You can go to Mayo's clinic and extend your life three or four years. But my friend, it doesn't give real life. It doesn't give eternal life here and now and out yonder in eternity. 
doesn't give it. Only wisdom can do that, and wisdom is Christ. That is the problem with this man. And again and again, you notice that is said. Now, verse 21, it says, "...also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee." Now, don't be disturbed by reports. Somebody that knows you pretty well is going to say you're a crook. But don't let it bother you, because if you take the easy route, the middle of the road, you're going to find that in the long run, the community will applaud you. And they may vote you the man of the year. They may vote you the most valuable citizen that they've got. May I say, friends, this is putrid. This is puerile. This is nothing in the world but living like, well, living like a vegetable, not like a man. Oh, today to have something vital and something that's real and not be, as a few years ago, even the atheistic novelist could write a book about Babbitt living on Main Street. What a picture. And that's a picture of a great many people today. Of course, he's a member of the church. And he'll argue religion with you any day you want to. And he'll drink with you any time you want to. And he'll go with this crowd to the burlesque show on Saturday night. He'll be at church Sunday morning, I assure you. But my friend, that is the thing that there's been rebellion against in this country, the hypocrisy of that kind of living. And many of a kid today has turned his back on that sort of thing. There are 2,000 of them out yonder on the big island of Hawaii. And I had the privilege of ministering to over a 100 of those kids. And quite a few of them turned to Christ. They have tried everything. They found out that there's no satisfaction in these things. And now many of them have turned to Christ. Well, why didn't they find that in the home? of people that are church members. My friend, because something is radically lacking today in the home. And a great many of these young people see the hypocrisy of it all, that church going is just about as hypocritical as anything they could do. It'd be better if they were godless atheists than to be that kind of a person because they might be reached with the gospel if they'd never heard it before, but when they've heard it again and again, well, it's just like they become hardened to that sort of thing as men become hardened to things in life. Now, I come to chapter 8, and again, we find that he's neither cold nor hot here. He's lukewarm. He's living today by what he calls the golden rule, although he hasn't any real idea of what it means and what it requires. He observes that there does not seem to be too much difference between the wicked and the righteous. They're all pretty much alike. Now look at this chapter, and I'll hit again high points here. Who is as the wise man? Who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be chained. Only Christ, who is real wisdom can change a man's life. He can come into a life and bring excitement, bring joy, bring peace, bring the things that are needed today and deliver us from living a mediocre existence. Now he says here, verse 2, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Be careful what you do, you see. Don't get in trouble. Now, verse 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Here's a king. He can take a stand. Why not live like a king and take a stand? There's one thing you can do today. I said to one of these hippies up in the Bay Area, I asked him, I said, why in the world do you take up this lifestyle? Why in the world are you dressing like you are? He says, well, I want liberty. I want freedom. 
I want to live as I please. I like to ask you a question. I said, if you changed your garb and went with your crowd, would they accept you? He thought of many. He said, I guess they wouldn't. I said, then you don't have much liberty, do you? <laughs> you got to follow the crowd, and you must have, as today apparently is basic to these young people is, they must have the approval of the crowd, of the pack. They must have their approval. And so they really don't know what liberty really is. Great many of them take drugs for no other reason. A young fellow said to me, I started smoking pot just because the gang he was with did it. In other words, he could not bear the disapproval of the crowd. They don't know what freedom is. I said to this young fellow, I said, look, you think I don't have freedom because I dress as I dress? Well, he said, I would say that. And I said, well, look, you know, I have a freedom to date you don't have. I don't have to dress like this all the time. I said, I can dress any way I please, too. And I'd be very frank with you. Those of you that have seen me in conferences know I don't conform to the pattern. I dress as I please. And I think we have liberty. And I said to this young fella, I said, listen. I have a freedom today that you don't have. You and I are living in a world where there's rebellion against God, and that's where everything's going. I said, you know, I can bow to Jesus Christ. I can call him my Lord and my Savior. I said, that's real freedom. The crowds go in one direction. I'm not going that direction. I've made my choice. I said, young man, if you want real freedom, come to Christ. He said, if the Son make you free... You'll be free indeed. Oh, today, that's the kind of freedom. Now, this man that is the do-gooder, he is as bad as the man down in the city jail. Actually, he is bound down by tradition. He's bound down by the rules of his little group. And he follows the pattern. He goes down the middle of the road. That's his lifestyle. And may I say to you, listen to verse 8, There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there's no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. There will come a day, if he keeps taking that cocktail, he'll have to go and take the treatment for being a drunkard. And many of them have to do that. Oh, there are millions of them today in this country. They all do gooders. And then there's one day he's going to have to die. And my friend, he won't take the middle of the road on that day because death's going to come at him and remove him here. Now, verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And what a picture that is of our contemporary society. Because judgment is not executed, men are doing evil because it's in their hearts. And that's the reason a great many men today continue in sin. Well, they said, look, I've been in sin for five years and God's done nothing about it. My friend, that's already his judgment upon you. He's done nothing about it because he's way down the road waiting for you. In fact, he can wait till eternity. You can't. Now is the accepted time. Now will you notice... Verse 14 and 15 here make it very clear. He observes that there does not seem to be too much difference between the wicked and the righteous. And there isn't when it's all on the surface. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I say that this also is vanity. Why, it doesn't make any difference. Both men come to the same end. Verse 15, Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. And this man finally ends up living like this. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. My friend, that is the saddest philosophy of life anybody can have. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee described life well today, didn't he? When you try to live the good life, you're left with nothing, even when you get everything you want. We all know plenty of people who are chasing the wind, as Solomon described the futility of life apart from God. 
Maybe this touches you personally today. You may identify with Solomon, who tried to find satisfaction everywhere, except for where God says that we'll find it. Well, if you're at a place where you'd like to turn to Jesus, like the woman from Bulgaria who described her journey, then we'd like to celebrate that decision by offering you some helpful material about the salvation found only in Jesus Christ. It'll help you understand from God's Word the incredible gift that God offers you today. To find out more, visit ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and we'll put some materials in the mail to you. Now tomorrow, our journey through Ecclesiastes continues, so please join us for more godly encouragement as we make our way through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.